ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. My name is Yvonne Weldon. I am a Raja woman from Cowra here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, also known as Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I am the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the cultural authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land that I am on. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders past and present, to all First Nations and to all of you. It is always a humbling privilege to provide a welcome to country. For me, it is a profound honour and a luxury of time. Time given by you and time of the many warriors that start the traditions for everyone. A welcome isn't just words, it is a reflection of where we are. Not this modern day place, but the continuous link of life, lessons, purpose and nurturing supplies. The boundaries of our traditional owners are not defined by the hand or by the pen, but through the natural landscapes of the earth. The Our Nation's country covers the Hawke's River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Camaragal. I acknowledge the Camaragal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. Wherever you travel across this beautiful continent of ours, you un understand you are entering the lands of nations, tribes and clans that have existed here for over 60,000 years. The First Nations of this land are the most resilient, unique and sustainable people on the planet. We are the oldest living culture of the world. Traditionally across the lands and the waterways, we traded and we shared for necessity and not for empires. Our sharing and trading brought our people together. It created our sustainability, encouraging our innovation and keeping our ancient practices alive for our future and for everyone's future. There are many Aboriginal warriors that have crossed this land before all of us, creating pathways before they were any. And to give respect and honour, could you all please pause for a moment to remember the many sacrifices that have been made along the way, the ones we will continue to make and the ones we shouldn't have to. As you connect, learn and share, today, tomorrow and beyond. Continue to learn from our ancient practices, never forgetting their ancestors, your people and future generations, working in partnership equally. All of us can make up positive changes for this country now and into the future. So in these times of this pandemic, don't let the social distance make us socially absent. We must maintain physical distancing by not creating barriers to our social connections whether it's through your work, your family or networks, creating an inclusion and acceptance and a resilience. All of us together can bring about positive changes to multiple generations. We are in this together. So let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm David Kosh and honoured to be hosting the 2020 National Recognition Presentation. For the first time since its inception 58 years ago, the Australian Export and Investment Awards have been paused. Instead, this presentation is recognising the incredible achievements of our exporters during what has been one of the most challenging years in recent history. To join in the conversation, ensure you've downloaded the Eventcast by Fourth Wall app. Use these QR codes for easier downloading. Then use the app code export and log in with your email address and unique pin sent you by email. Can't find your pin? Well, click the reset password button on the login window. You'll get an email with all the details. Using the app's discuss button, to tell us where you are watching us from. I'm hoping to see lots of Port fans, of course, representing Adelaide. I'd also like to thank the state and territory governments for their support this year, as well as the program's longtime partners, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. And a thank you to the program's supporters, Export Finance Australia and Australian Made. Welcome to the Governor-General of Australia, David Hurley, as well as Senator, the Honourable Simon Birmingham, Minister for Finance and Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Joining this stellar cast of inspiring exporters, business experts and guest speakers 
including investor and entrepreneur Gus Balbonten and AI expert Dr Katrina Wallace. Well, what a tough, tough year it's been. The triple blow of the drought, bushfires, then global pandemic, it's just been devastating for Australian businesses and their people. But Australians are resilient, pushing through the hardship slowly but surely, recovering, regenerating and rebounding. Look, I've spoken to plenty of Australian business owners in my time, and I know they are nothing short of amazing. And when we asked you to share your stories of how you overcame the challenges of 2020, we were absolutely blown away by your response. More than 360 exporters from across Australia submitted their stories, inspiring stories of how you defied convention, adapted, and even transformed your business. And in true Aussie spirit, you met the challenges in creative, unexpected, and interesting ways. Throughout the presentation, we'll hear some of these stories, share invaluable insights from them, and hopefully leave you with some practical advice on how to prepare yourself for 2021. Technology has been a big theme through your stories, and none more so than with summer nats, from the Australian Capital Territory. Who would have thought a 34-year-old car festival in Canberra could be catapulted onto the world stage during a global pandemic? Well, they did it. They took their brand worldwide by launching a video game, which has been downloaded over half a million times across the world. But it's not only been technology that's paved the way for exporters this year. Beck Hardy Wines, worked hard on their business strategy during 2020. The South Australian company mapped out new markets to expand its export mix, enabling the winery to export to nine new international markets. What an amazing feat during a global pandemic. The speed at which our exporters adapted their business to the new reality was also impressive. Geelong manufacturer, Care Essentials, installed eight PPE machines in under three months and worked with Australian researchers to produce masks, respirators and other equipment. Their fast action enabled the company to hire 50 new staff and support other Australian businesses by sourcing supplies from them. So well done. It was heartening to hear of the monumental efforts businesses made to look after their people during the year. Flavortech, put its staff first, providing mental health support and ensured its skilled workers were able to stay in jobs. Tasmania's Sullivan's Cove Distillery rewrote rosters and trained the cellar door team to become junior distillers, while the Northern Territory's Dutch Jan Sandalwood Oils turned its focus on helping protect the Indigenous Australian communities its sources its traditional oils from. This is just a taste of some of the remarkable stories shared by Australian businesses this year, and there's plenty more to come. I'd like to introduce the Governor-General of Australia, His Excellency General the Honourable David Hurley, to share his thoughts on the year that was. It's an understatement to say that 2020 has brought challenges. Over the course of my time in office, we've seen drought, bushfires and now the pandemic. Any of those three would have presented a challenge. The triple whammy is unprecedented. Add to that changing overseas markets, disruptions to supply chains and global economic uncertainty, and the challenges our export community have faced have been considerable. And yet you are unbowed. More than that, you are ready to take on the future. Your resilience and innovation this year have been remarkable. On behalf of all Australians, thank you and well done. Know that your hard work and commitment in the face of adversity are appreciated. Today is a celebration, not of the end of the job, because many challenges remain, but it's a celebration of how you have performed in the most trying of circumstances. Take confidence from that, celebrate it, and recharge for more. Australia needs your leadership, courage, and innovation now more than ever. Thank you, Governor-General, for your words of encouragement. I wholeheartedly agree. Stories shared from across Australia spoke of leadership, courage and innovation. There were extraordinary and inspiring examples of the pragmatic and optimistic spirit Australians are known for worldwide. 
This was a year when our exporting community demonstrated its invaluable importance to not only Australia's economy, but also local communities. Let me share this comment from Northern Territory 3D printing business, Speed 3D. They said, our proudest moment has been developing our technology into a useful tool to make an impact against COVID-19. To talk more about the importance of export and trade and the remarkable resilience of Australian businesses, I'd like to introduce Minister for Finance and Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham. Thanks, Koshi, and thanks so much for doing this event once again, mate. Thank you also to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to our team at Austrade and our event partners for bringing us together. This year, for the first time in its 58-year history, we've paused the traditional Australian Export and Investment Awards and have done what so many of Australia's exporters have done throughout 2020. We have pivoted. It's been a tough year for exporters. When COVID-19 hit, the repercussions for businesses all over Australia were sudden and in some cases devastating. Through it all, Australians have responded with our trademark resilience, a sense of optimism, ingenuity and generosity. I'm pleased to be here, although virtually, to celebrate. To celebrate the exporters who pulled out all the stops in 2020, who rethought their business models, who developed new products and services, and who found new ways to reach customers. More than 360 businesses from right across Australia have shared their stories of 2020 with us, showcasing their breadth of talent, diversity and innovation. Together, as part of Australia's 53,000 strong cohort of goods exporters, you support and contribute to around one in five Australian jobs. Compared to non-exporting businesses, you hire more staff, pay higher wages and have higher labour productivity. And in a year unlike any other, you have stepped up to the challenge. As international flights were grounded and supply chains unravelled, you managed to still hit a record trade surplus of $77.4 billion this year, with November marking the 34th consecutive month of a trade surplus where Australia has exported more as a nation than we've imported. This demonstrates the integral part Australian exporters have in our economy, built through an international reputation for premium goods, services and experiences, which you have worked so hard to achieve. In a year that has challenged us all, you have gone above and beyond to support your fellow Australians, whether it be donating essential goods like hand sanitizer, manufacturing in-demand equipment such as ventilators and face masks, or supporting the mental health and well-being of your staff. The benefits of your work go far beyond Australia too, helping to treat cancer patients in Singapore, China and New Zealand, assisting airports globally to adopt COVID safe measures and delivering virtual learning experiences for students all around the world. While many business owners will continue to feel the strains of a global economic downturn for some time to come, the stories that you have taken the time to share will serve as an inspiration for others to adapt their businesses, to innovate and diversify. Your advice will guide other businesses as they begin to rebuild. Importantly, you have demonstrated to Australians, to international customers and investors alike, that our export community is full of determination and innovation. Of course, we recognise that exporters cannot go it alone. For example, with 90% of Australia's air freight exports traditionally leaving in the bellies of passenger aircraft, the COVID-19 pandemic not only brought international travel to a standstill, but also led to major air freight shortages, disrupting supply chains across the globe. In response, the Morrison government launched the International Freight Assistance Mechanism to help exporters get their high quality produce into key overseas markets, with return flights bringing back vital medical supplies and equipment. This has helped to create freight capacity for producers right around the country, maintaining hard-earned contracts with overseas customers, 
in 67 international destinations. To date, this mechanism has supported over $3 billion worth of exports. Our government, in response to the many challenges in the trade environment at present, also continues to pursue new free trade agreements with the United Kingdom and the European Union to give Australian farmers and businesses even more export opportunities and even better market access into more countries. Most recently, we signed on to the world's largest free trade agreement, accounting for 30% of global population and GDP. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement brings together Australia and 14 Indo-Pacific nations, creating a single framework to improve trade in goods, services and investment right across our region. Our government continues to support Australians, providing some $507 billion in economic support this year. Temporary, targeted and measured support programs, such as JobKeeper, are helping to keep businesses in business and Australians in jobs. We know it is more important than ever that the government continues to support our exporters, creating new export opportunities and delivering better market access with key international trading partners. As the global trade and investment landscape changes, our government will continue to work alongside industry to support you in your endeavours and Australia's export successes. None of this would be possible without you. So thank you for all that you do, for creating jobs and for making the leap to take your businesses onto the world stage. I'm delighted to invite you now to take a moment to celebrate the wins, to celebrate your work and together to take a look at some of the remarkable, resilient businesses that not only survived 2020, but are coming out of the other side thriving. Thank you, Minister. So interesting to hear those figures championing exporters and the initiatives you're leading. Now to those businesses. Every year, the Australian Export and Investment Awards honour the achievements of outstanding exporters and investors. But this year, we're doing things differently. We're showcasing amazing Australian businesses that not only survived 2020, but thrived. Using innovation and creative thinking, these Australian brands broke the mould and carved out new pathways in their industries. Let's hear their insights. To read the full stories and get more insights into how you can rebuild in 2021, visit exportawards.gov.au. What a fantastic introduction to some of the most inspiring stories we received from which emerged some common themes. Many of you tackled the challenges of COVID by diversifying your business or taking an entirely new direction, whether through innovation, technology, or by reviewing your business strategies. To discuss some of these very themes and draw out insights you can apply to your own business, let's hear from a panel of business experts and industry representatives. Joining us is Tim Beresford, Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. I'm sure many of you are familiar with and may even have used the services of the Australian Government's Trade Promotion and Investment Attraction. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, David. 
Uh, we're also honoured to welcome three business leaders. The first is Sarah Liu, who is here with us in the studio today. Sarah is founder and managing director of the Dream Collective, who shared their inspiring story with the program this year. Their mission is to empower businesses to improve their diversity and inclusivity practices and see more women in leadership. Over the last eight years, the company has worked with over 950 clients, including Adidas, PayPal and Google. During the pandemic, Sarah's business created and delivered a new product offering in just three weeks. Welcome, Sarah. Good to see you. Uh, next is Alan Oppenheim, Managing Director of Ego Pharmaceuticals, a family-owned company that's been in business since 1953. Ego manufactures dermatological skincare and its range of 120 products are made in Australia, including the well-known brand QV Skincare. Ego Pharmaceuticals was the Australian Exporter of the Year in 2017. Good to see you again, Alan. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Kochi. And also Daleen Ray, uh, Managing Director of OBE Organic, Australia's first 100% certified organic beef exporter. The company is also accredited as a mentally healthy workplace. When COVID-19 hit, OBE Organic was able to pass on its knowledge to help staff, farmers, suppliers and stakeholders withstand the stresses that the pandemic brought. Daleen, welcome to you. Thanks, David. And finishing off this august group is James Pearson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The Chamber represents Australian businesses of all shapes and sizes across all sectors of the economy and from every quarter of our country. James, always good to see you. Welcome. Good to see you again, David. Now, thank you all for joining us to share your wisdom and experience. There, there were a number of emerging themes picked up across the story shared with us this year. So let's kick off with resilience. It's a quality that helped businesses through the year's challenges and something I imagine we will continue to call on for a while yet. So how can businesses build resilience, both resilience to outside shocks, such as those we've seen this year, but also internally to protect the mental well-being of employees. Uh, Sarah and Daleen, why don't you tackle this one first of all? Sarah, what are your thoughts? I think it's really interesting um, question, a very big topic around resilience. Um, I come at it from like a four perspectives. So I think practically how business can build resilience lies on four things. One is actually how do we create certainty in the midst of uncertainty? So one of human condition is the need actually for certainty. So it's actually looking at, okay, if we are in a really volatile environment um, we, and we don't have visibility for the next six or 12 months, how can we actually help our team, our business, creating certainty on a daily basis, weekly uh, basis. So actually creating what we call the micro certainty. And then the other thing is actually about seeing opportunities. You know, I think with every crisis, as we've seen with uh, a result of COVID-19, that actually opportunity comes at the back of it. So actually creating impact. And then the other thing is actually about our sensitivity as leaders. So one thing when you talked about, you know, the mental wellness of employees, something that we've seen during this time is that if you're seeing poor performance and disengagement coming from your employees, it usually indicates, you know, um, a bigger problem behind mm -hmm. it. So it's actually us developing sensitivity as leaders and actually making sure that we help connect our teams with the business impact that they are creating. Yeah. Darlene? Well, thanks. And building on Sarah's comments, I think this is an opportunity for exports to consider the benefits of becoming a mentally healthy organisation. We started our journey a couple of years ago. We're an agribusiness. Uh, mental health is not necessarily talked about in our industry. We started our pathway and it set us up for success during COVID. We did a lot of training pre-COVID. And what that meant is when COVID hit and we were bombarded with lots and lots of challenges, like many of you have been in the audience, we were able to have conversations in a particular way with both our team members and also our stakeholders that really set us up for success. Sometimes they were difficult conversations, but because of the training that we had through mental health courses, we were able to have those in a kind way and get the outcomes that we were looking for. Mm. Now, diversification was another theme across many of the stories and an activity that is becoming increasingly important in navigating volatile trade markets. Let's open up this to the whole panel. What does diversification look like from your perspective 
And how can exporters do this successfully to help them manage risk? Tim, let's start with you. Yeah, look, thanks, David. Um, look, uh, no doubt businesses like, like Sarah's and, and Darlene's and, and, and Allen's have, have really you know, looked at diversification across a number of lenses. Clearly markets uh, and diversifying and expanding across markets. Uh, product sets and thinking around product sets and, and how one has actually got the right mix of product sets. And, and then obviously you go to market, your channels. So if you break each one of those down, look, from an Australian perspective, Australia's uh, trade flows, 92% of them actually go to 20 markets. So as one thinks of their business and their markets, ha have you got a nice balanced portfolio across the markets that really matter for you in your business? In terms of products, um, obviously COVID-19 has thrown up extraordinary challenges. Have you actually had to um, recast or rebuild products or actually move into adjacent products? These are, this is another form of diversification. And finally, as we think of channels, uh, you go to market you know, and building resilience around your supply chain. A great example is uh, illustrated by vacuum pack meat. Uh, now vacuum pack meat, which is a high quality product which gets into the UAE can actually now, because of the shelf life in the UAE being 180 days, can actually go by ships as opposed to by air freight. So thinking of different ways, different channels, different go-to-market strategies. So for me, from a diversification perspective, it's around markets, products and channels. And clearly our job as the Australian Trade and Investment Commission is to help your businesses actually diversify into the markets you're looking at. Mm. Sarah? I think it's really interesting um, when we talk about diversification, very, um, to Tim's point, um, very often we do come at it from a market products channel perspective. Um, something that I've actually learned um, to be quite uh, exciting when we think about diversification of opportunities is actually looking at your customer's life cycle and where you can diversify within that. So I think sometimes when we talk about diversification, immediately we think going broader, going wider, and sometimes that actually leads to dilution of your brand. Something that we find really effective is actually look at how you can diversify within your niche. So let's say we work with technology companies. We actually walk them through the life cycle of their employee journey. How do they attract women? How do they retain women? How do they advance women? And that creates diversification opportunities in and within itself. Alan? Australia has a portfolio of quality products serviced by diverse people and keen to work with customers in other cultures in a pragmatic and humble and fun-loving way. And I think that gives us great strength to make a difference for the world. Dailene? Yeah, I think um, diversification in markets is very important. And I support the idea of considering places like the Middle East and Latin America, which might seem a little bit complicated for, for exporters to grapple with, with regard to distance and also some technical trade barriers. But I encourage exporters to think of markets like that because we need to remember that when we export to an easy market, which might be North America, for example, that's also easy for our competitors. So we need to keep that in mind when we're considering where we want to place our product. And we need to, sometimes it's, it's um, strategic to go somewhere that's quite difficult, which means it will be quite difficult for everyone else to put their product there as well. Uh, James? You know, uh, Aki represents uh, overwhelmingly small and medium-sized companies, and a lot of them um, are exposed uh, overwhelmingly to one or two markets. So diversification for them is a real challenge sometimes because they don't have that back-of-house resource as well. So they need to be doing market research with the help of uh, organisations like Austrade, like the State and Territory Chamber of Commerce Network and Industry Associations, the Inter International Chamber of Commerce, for example, uh, has a, a, a lot of information in terms of supporting SMEs uh, in trade. So not being afraid to ask for help and for advice is, is important. I also want to say that, you know, thinking about markets that dry up for whatever reason or change, thinking about how you might be able to get your product or service into that market, into another part of that same market, might be worth doing. So, for example, if a, if a country decides, for whatever reason, not to buy so much of an Australian product, then maybe you can get your product into the manufacturing process of a third country, which is still mm -hmm. able to export into that, uh, into that market. So, you know, there are lots of ways to skin a cat, but 
don't be afraid to ask for help if you're an SME. We know it's hard and there are a lot of people in Australia who want to help uh, SMEs get into export and do exporting even better. Yeah, really good point. Um, innovation also helped our exporters overcome their supply chain issues. Uh, James and Alan, what are some practical steps businesses can take to embed an innovation mindset right across their organisation? Uh, James, let's start with you. I think the important point here is don't think of innovation as some out there over horizon thing that um, you've got to be big or incredibly intelligent to do. Uh, in my experience, Australian companies are innovating every day. You're taking your existing process and you're adapting it, you're running it cheaper, leaner, faster, you may be changing the production process, you may be changing where you get the thing made or how you get it made, you might be investing in a new machine. So if we start recognising that innovation is actually what most successful businesses, particularly exporters, do every day, it kind of demystifies it. And then Let's think about great examples we've seen over the past few months. In Australia, for example, I've seen it firsthand how people making gin switch to making hand sanitizer. Personally, I think that's a tragedy, but if it presents, <laughs> prevents tragedies, then that's a very good thing. Um, it's a real example, and it can give us confidence that Australia's, Australian companies can do this. Yep. Alan? Uh, for Ego, innovation is based on strong science, good communication and persistence. And I think we need persistence, particularly in the international market. For us in our pharmaceutical game, the regulations of each country is a real challenge and each country has its own sweet rules. We encourage innovation in every facet of Ego and that includes registration of products with health departments. So I give a couple of examples. To get one new product available to consumers without prescription in one country took us 15 years to get the regulator to agree. I won't name the country, but let's just say it's a country you know well. Second example, to get eager products available in Saudi Arabia took us 10 years of working with and through and on the regulator. And that's quite a deal of persistence. And today, Saudi Arabia is our biggest export market, 35 million people. We've got about 60 of our own staff spread right across a fantastic market for us. Really challenging, though. So innovation can be applied to every facet of the business, even if it's registration of your products through health departments, which most people would think would be quite bureaucratic. We try to encourage that, that spirit of innovation right across our team, our people. Wow, they're great stories. If I can uh, add a point here as yep. well. During um, COVID, we actually conducted a market research wow, with over 4,000 um, Australian workers. And we asked the question, what um, the companies that were able to innovate during this time had in common? And what we uncovered was actually a diverse leadership team. So um, I think a message here for all the um, sort of export businesses would actually be to build a diverse team, diverse decision-making stakeholder team, and the fact you know, that you will innovate becomes a byproduct. Yeah, that's a really good point. Look, as we come to the end of the year and begin to reflect on the last 12 months, Tim, what is one reflection or piece of advice you'd like to share with everyone watching, all of the exporters? Yeah, thanks, David. Look, it has been a remarkable year, unprecedented, with the challenges we've just shared on the panel. I mean, if there was, if there was two words, for me, one of the reflections for the year is strategic patience. Strategic in the sense of knowing what to do, but also you know, knowing what not to do. Have a plan, thinking through that plan, being really clear what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and how we're going to do it, as well as what we're not going to do. And, and I think the other word is also patience. And you, you just heard from Alan about the patience that, that his own business has had in terms of making the right choices, having resilience and being patient. So for me, mm -hmm. strategic patience is certainly a reflection that's washed over 2020 for me. Yep, so for me, it's the realization that that um, it's not the big that will eat the small, it's the fast that will eat the slow. That has been a realization um, for the past year. Um, and I think actually really recognizing and embracing um, the importance of speed to change and speed to adaptation will be key to succeed. Mm. Alan? I think if you empower and support your people consistently, then they'll surprise you positively. 
and will be more resilient and more satisfied through whatever challenges are thrown at us, whether it's um, um, COVID uh, or whatever the rules are changing in our pharmaceutical game. It's all about our people and empowering them to succeed. Mm. Daily. I would encourage exporters to maintain or become members of peak industry bodies. Organisations like the Export Council of Australia and the Australian Arab Chamber of Commerce play a really important role in advocating on behalf of exporters to government. And I think importantly, when you're in a crisis as a business and you're perhaps um, looking like a bit of a lunatic because you're in a crisis <laughs> and we've all been there, it's really important to be able to pick up this the phone and speak to the policy officers in these in these peak industry bodies and they can help you synthesize information and articulate it back to government in a meaningful way and i found government to be really responsive but they need information to be presented to them in a certain way and i think uh, peak industry bodies play a really important um, role in doing that and sometimes when we're cutting costs or managing our overheads we're thinking about cancelling our memberships and i would really encourage exporters to maintain their memberships all become members of new peak industry bodies. OK. Uh, James, did you pay Dayling 20 bucks to uh, say that, coming from the Australian <laughs> Chamber of Commerce and Industry, peak body? Well, look, <laughs> thank you, Dayling. You've just described my day job, so that's terrific. What's, um, a, what's your look, piece I'm, of advice? Look, I'm a great believer, um, particularly in times of great uncertainty, such as what we're living through now, in being open and transparent and honest. There's a great deal of fear, uh, lots of different kinds of fear in the community, and a lot of exporters are frightened too about their futures, and, and I understand that. Be open and transparent with your staff. Explain to them what the challenges are, um, where the opportunities might lie, and ask them for their input. And also be brave enough to have the same conversation with the people in your supply chain, your people who supply you and your customers as well. Explain to them what difficulties you might be facing, why things might be delayed, and see if you can't co-create solutions mm -hmm. with them. I know it's not always the way to go, but at a time like this when people are uncertain and are worried and tend to go back in their shell, I've found that being open and honest and engaging people in your supply chain could really get you through the hard times. It'll build understanding and respect. And quite seriously, you may be with them able to co-create new opportunities, both for yourselves and for them. So now we're at the crystal ball stage as a final comment. Tell us what you think Australia has to offer the world in 2021. Uh, let's start with your thoughts, James. It's well-being. Um, we've got the virus under control. It's not licked yet, but it's about well-being. It's about doing things really well, and it's about being the kind of place that people should know and be confident that they can put their money here and it'll give them a good return. They can buy goods and services from our country. They'll get top-quality, reliable, trustworthy suppliers. Daylene? David, as you know, we're a huge country with a huge heart. We produce amazing food and fibre and we have the expertise to export it safely and reliably around the world. Alan? Oh, I think Australia's got a portfolio of really top quality products serviced by diverse people. We are a very diverse population, which is a great strength. And we're keen to work with customers in other cultures um, and in that sense, we do that in a pragmatic, in a humble and fun-loving way. Why wouldn't you want to live in Australia <laughs> in a company that's a country that's going to be exporting lots of products to the world? Yep. Sarah? I think for us, it's really harnessing the power of human capital. I think Australia, with a wealth of natural resources that we've typically had, that's been a really core focus. And I think the next phase of opportunity for Australia, for us to be really seen, recognised, celebrated um, in the world, would be around um, really capitalising on human capital, professional services, and how we can actually bring our expertise and thought leadership on the world stage. And finally, Tim? Well, thanks, David. I think the panel summed it up brilliantly. Look, from, from my perspective, from our perspective, Australia has demonstrated we are a safe harbour. We're a safe place to work, live, to, to export, to invest in. And, and building on the panel's points, really, in terms of the capital, both human capital and our resource capital, you know, we're agile and we are ready, willing and able to serve the international global community in 2021.
Yep, we're in the right spot, aren't we? Um, that has been fantastic, team. Thank you so much, uh, Tim, first of all, for, for being with us. Thanks, David. Sarah? Thank you so see. much. Alan, some great perspectives. Appreciate it. Thank you. Daleen, wonderful advice. Thanks, David. And James, always good to see you. Thanks again, David. Well, so many valuable nuggets of information that will help nurture the workforce of exporters and build a stronger, more resilient and agile business. So how can businesses learn to adapt quickly and capitalise on opportunities? Our first keynote speaker, Gus Balbonten, will delve into this. He's an investor, entrepreneur and explorer who has spent two decades helping businesses adjust strategies, products and services to better deal with rapid and regular market changes. Gus will be speaking on a subject most of you have had to deal with this year, agility and adaptability. His unique approach may just change the way you think about business transformation. To set the scene of agility and silver lining in cloudy times, I'd like to highlight success in this area. Tasmania's Sullivan's Cove Distillery told us, change brings opportunities you can never predict. To survive, you need to be ready to adapt at a moment's notice. Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair Foundation was under threat due to travel restrictions. The team at the foundation sprang into action, developing an online art fair in under three months. It was a massive success, with all ticketed events selling out in 24 hours, generating over 2.6 million in sales for the art centres and their communities, and created new international opportunities by showcasing the breathtaking work of Indigenous artists to the world. Finally, the team at Novaris, they're winning more business globally. Why? Because they can supply the products they now produce locally in Tasmania quicker than any of their competitors in other markets. Inspirational. Gus, take it away. Thanks, Koshi. Woo! Everyone, how's it going? So um, I grew up in, in the Argentinian Patagonia. Uh, for those that don't know where Patagonia is, it's not in Europe, just so you know. It's uh, at the bottom of Latin America. If you drive south from Canada, as far as you can go, you eventually will hit Patagonia. So I grew up in this little tiny place in the middle of nowhere, comparable to something like Broken Hill, without being disrespectful to anyone. You know, one of those shitty little places that you grew up and there's not much to do in that place and your dreams are predefined for you. Um, but I grew up with big dreams, right? I wanted to travel the world. And we come from very, very humble beginnings in my family. So, you know, being on a plane was a big deal. Like, they've never been on a plane before and here I am saying I want to travel the world. But by the age of 17, I managed to get myself a scholarship and I landed in Australia, out of all places, in, in, in Barham Bay. Um, and look, I'm going to cut a story short. Uh, I ended up look, falling in love with a girl at school, um, asking her to get married with me when I was 17, two weeks after I met her. She said no to me. I was in shock because I thought, like, check this out, what do you mean? And she's like, no, you're trying to get a visa to Australia. Eventually, I got over the visa. I got rid of the boyfriend as well, all sorts of things. I did eventually marry the girl of my dreams. I've got three children now. Um, yeah, no, we know, whoop, ready? Um, but, um, you know, I went back to Argentina, I went to uni, that didn't work. I ended up hitchhiking around Latin America for a number of years. Um, and I'll tell you one trick there that I did, and this is an important one. When I did that hitchhiking, I did it with no money in my pockets. I had no money in my pockets, I had no credit cards, and I did manage to cover like 40, 50,000 kilometers over a few years, um, you know, traveling around Latin America. And the most important thing I want to share with you is that I did that by being resourceful rather than being caught up with the concept of resources. And as our careers go on, we get more and more obsessed with resources. Effectively, we don't do anything unless we've got money, time, people. And let me tell you, the best innovation I've ever seen, the best stuff always comes from resourcefulness. 
Make sure you teach your kids to be as resourceful as they can. Don't give them everything because otherwise, you know, you create this dependency on resources, which is actually not something that we need to be able to tackle the future that we're actually, you know, uh, looking down the barrel of. So, look, I'm going to cut the story short. I ended up, you know, I, I, you know applying for a job at Lonely Planet. Um, I had none of the skills, but I managed to get myself a, an interview. Um, I convinced them and I spent 15 years at Lonely Planet. You know, I went from designer all the way to executive director. Um, and I managed to experience, I had the wonderful privilege of experiencing I guess the transformation, the disruption, the change that took place when the internet takes off, right? And in the late 90s, and all of a sudden, all of media gets caught in this situation where we don't know which way to go, right? We, you know, everyone is scrambling. New books, newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, everyone is like in this state of, of despair. Um, so the stories I'm going to share with you come from, you know, from a time, and I mean, today, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got a few businesses, I'm an investor, I'm an angel, um, and, and look, I'm still involved in transformation, innovation, and disruption, so the stories I'm going to share apply to all of you, right? Apply to everyone as businesses, but they apply to you as individuals, individuals just as much. So hopefully I managed to get you to suspend your disbelief, I'll provoke you a bit, shake you up, um, and, and then you do what you want with the information. So, let's get going. I always start with this. I always say, look, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, not the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Now, adaptability to me is critical because it doesn't matter how well you can predict the future. If you can adapt to that future, what's the point in knowing? What's the point in knowing, right? And we often tend to spend most of our time trying to speculate, right? We do market segmentation and customer trends and technology trends. And I always say to people, it doesn't matter how much speculation you put into it, it's still speculation, you're still trying to guess. Instead, spend most of your time doing the things that you can control right now so that you can adapt to whatever future emerges, right? Now, let me tell you, let me set the scene. You know, the book at the top is the Gutenberg Bible. That's the first book ever printed. And the one at the bottom is a Lonely Planet brand new book, I guess. And we put this picture in front of the publisher to say, hey, listen, it's really difficult to innovate at Lonely Planet because nothing has changed, you know, in like five centuries, right? And he quickly got up and said, you know, you're wrong, guys. We've got chapter ends in black, which you can see in there. And we've got, you know, pagination and we've got bold font. And, you know, he's really excited because he's going, because we've got bold. We've come a long way in five centuries. And I was, you know, meanwhile, stabbing myself in the hour with chopsticks, you know, going, why am I working in this company? Oh my God, they don't get innovation. Now, here's an important lesson behind this. When you do the same thing over and over again, you build momentum. And we often tend to associate momentum with a positive thing. Now, be careful. Momentum is positive if your momentum and the customer is pointing in the same direction. But the moment your customer changes direction, your momentum that was really good for efficiencies like cost cutting and, you know, doing things quicker and faster, all of a sudden becomes deadly because it's pointing in the wrong way. It's not pointing in the direction of the customer. So please don't underestimate momentum being really dangerous in your business. Yeah. Now, this is what happened to us. In the late 90s, we got hit with everything all at once. We got hit with technology change, social change, political change, you know, and it all started coming. And you can see in there a picture that I said the age of pandemics. Now, I've been using this slide for like five years now. So I've been telling people, listen, you know, this is true. This is true to us. You know, we live in an age now where this can happen to all of us. In travel for us, when SARS hit, we actually felt all the things that we're feeling right now in a, in a smaller way, but we got a taste of it, right? We knew what it was like and we knew the, the dramatic effect of it in some way. So disruption looks a bit like this, right? If you, you know, your business might be doing okay right now, everything is fine. Someone comes into the market, promises a better solution, right? We often underestimate it. Now, it doesn't have to be a better solution or a product or a service. It could also be a disruption such as a pandemic, right? We often tend to underestimate at the beginning. It fails or it doesn't quite eventuate the way we think it will. We get a little kick because we thought, I told you so, it wasn't going to happen. And then, of course, something happens. Now, this is the case for us, for example, with maps. I don't know if you remember, but, you know, back in the day, there was lots of mapping companies that did printed maps, yeah? Remember the printed maps with little dots and lines and things in them? You know, and someone came into the market and said, we're going to map the entire world. And of course, most of us in mapping at that point in time, and Lonely Planet was one of those companies together with many others, kind of laughed at that and went, hilarious, you can't do that, the, you know, the world is massive. And of course, at the beginning, they failed. You know, the original Google Maps were not very good. And then effectively, we got a little kick because we thought, 
we told you so. Then eventually, of course, they did map the entire world and it was too late to do anything about with those maps. Now, same happens with pandemics. Now, remember that I mentioned to you, the age of pandemics has been coming for a while. And of course, you know, if you kept in your same trajectory, even though you knew that potentially another pandemic would hit, you underestimated it. And of course, nothing happened for a long time and then all of a sudden it comes back and the trajectory of the new pandemics is a different trajectory. So don't underestimate disruption. The crazier it sounds, the crazier it sounds, the more you pay attention. So most of you have been super successful at going through this, which is incredible. Now remember, happens again and again. And if it's not a pandemic, it's technology. If it's not technology, it's social disruption. Something always keeps coming through, right? And at the beginning, it kind of fails a bit and then it comes through all the way. Now, here's the funny thing that holds us back. Often when we put a procedure in place, a process in place, a system in place, software, something that works, the first thing we do as humans is we pour concrete over the entire thing, right? We hate change so much that we go, oh my God, concrete that stuff up and never ever change it again. You know this, right? You know, universities are full of concrete, banks are full of concrete, dare I say governments full of concrete, right? Something works, don't change it, concrete all up. And of course, Here's your beautiful concrete, all tidy, everything works, everything is, you know, like clockwork, and the customer decides to do a different thing, and it goes down the dirt path, and you panic, because you go, oh no, the customer is going the wrong way, we've been doing this for a very long time, and we're doing it really well, and we build this path for you, customer, please don't leave us, come back, but the customer decides to go a different way, because of course the customer always picks the path of least resistance. The customer doesn't care about your concrete or what you put together or your systems, your process, your software, how efficient it is. They don't care about that. All they care about is fixing their own problem. If you can't follow the customer down the dirt path, that concrete is holding you back. I'm assuming that most of you would have to rip the concrete up to make sure that you can adjust and adhere to all the things that have just happened, you know, happening right now with the pandemic. Please don't lay it down again. Make sure you stay on that dirt path because it's going to keep changing and moving and shifting. Customers are moving faster than ever these days. Now, you know when someone calls you and they say to you, I'm stuck in traffic? You need to remind them that they're not stuck in traffic. They are the traffic, right? Often people tend to go, you know, when disruption hits, they start pointing the finger and it's always somebody else's fault, right? It's always, now it's the executive team, the marketing team, you know, it's the headquarters, it's the government. It's always someone's fault. But it's never our fault. Now let me tell you, if you want to deal with disruption, you have to remember that you need to own it. It's the only way. You need to own the problem and the solution, both. Now, redefining team is really important. I always say to people, you know, today the pandemic has made this really, really clear. Your team is not just the people sitting around you. Your team is your partners, your suppliers, your shareholders, your board, you know, your customers. Make sure your customers are part of the team. I dare even say your competitors are part of your team. The problems that we need to fix right now, I mean, if you think of the two big major supermarket corporations in Australia, they had to come together to fix some of the problems that they were facing with the customers when it comes to supply chain. So don't underestimate it. The concept of team has broadened. Now, it is a big network that you need to make sure you make work for yourself. So, let me finish with this. I said somebody should do something about that, and then I realized I am somebody. Please remember, do something about it and keep doing it because things are gonna to continue to change all the time. So whatever you got used to it so far and you've been very successful at doing, keep doing it. It's gonna keep coming. Thank you so much. Wow, amazing energy and enthusiasm. Thanks for that, Gus, really appreciate it. Look, it really is food for thought that we can all take into 2021. The ability to adapt quickly is not just important now, it's an important asset for the future. You know what Gus said earlier about your team not just being the people sitting around you? I think that's something every exporter or international business can relate to. Like Canberra's Asper Medical, a former Australian exporter of the year who deliver healthcare services around the world. When COVID hit, it was on the front line assisting nations in their response. And here in Australia, it partnered with a Melbourne-based business to develop contact tracing wearable tech. No easy feat. We truly do have the power in Australia to do amazing things, particularly when we work together. COVID-19 also put technology front and centre for every business around the world, including many of our exporters. Queensland's Ag Unity created a digital marketplace to link farmers and co-ops to international buyers while providing contactless transactions. Epichem, 
It met the challenges of COVID-19 head-on, developing exciting technologies to help keep us safe, like their smart surface spray and a dyed hand sanitizer to show you the spots that you missed. But their spirit has also been amazing, no pun intended, providing free expertise to help gin distilleries manufacture their own hand sanitizer and donating thousands of bottles of hand sanitizer to community organisations in need. Here to talk further about some of the incredible technology developments happening around us is Dr. Katrina Wallace. She's an entrepreneur in artificial intelligence and founder of Flamingo AI, the second female-led company to list on the ASX. Katrina established one of the world's first consultancies focused on helping organisations develop ethical AI frameworks and capabilities. Over to you, Katrina. And thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Very pleased to be with you. And today I am joining you in this session from Sydney. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land here in Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And also really welcome any Indigenous people on the session with us today. Well, I am going to talk with you about this whole concept of digital transformation and how we as Australian exporters need to start thinking about transforming our businesses and our business models and even our leader behaviours to meet the current times. And I'm gonna talk you through uh, a way to think about doing that. But first of all, I would like to just let you know a little bit more about myself as an Australian exporter. So I uh, founded a business called Flamingo AI. We provide machine learning, artificial intelligence products. We build them here in Sydney, and then we have an office in uh, the US, in New York and in Hartford. And so during COVID, uh, I also had the same experience as many of you uh, of the difficulties in, in what the pandemic had brought to, um, to ex export markets. And in addition to that, I am also a, a cattle farmer. So we have a family property, a 12,000 acre Aberdeen Angus farm up near Gloucester. And at exactly this time, 12 months ago, our farm was completely incinerated and decimated by the fires. So we've had a long, difficult path uh, trying to build the property back uh, since that time. So for those of you in, in primary industry and those of you in, in export, um, I relate very much to some of the challenges that we've had this year. But as a technologist, I want to just share you some insights into what I think is going on. So what is super interesting is that we know that in the last five months, we've had the equivalent of five years of technology advancement. So in five months, five years of technology advancement. And why might that be? Well, there are five factors at play at the moment. One is that we have a huge amount of data, so big data that we use to train algorithms and machine learning uh, type products and artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these emerging tech use data and we have a lot of that to do that now. Second thing is the computational power. So today we have uh, a huge amount of computational power in order to process the algorithms and, and the machines that are part of the digital transformation era. And if we think about the extreme level of that, it is this. So in 1956, when artificial intelligence was first coined, uh, compared to today, so that was uh, 70 odd years, we have seen a one trillion times improvement or increase in computational power, quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, the third one is we are seeing digital transformation strategies as being in the top one to three strategies of organisations who are starting to perform and do well either uh, domestically or as exporters. And we're going to talk quite a lot about digital transformation in a minute. Um, emerging or uh, maturing of emerging tech is another key factor. So these are a number of technologies that were previously uh, kind of struggling to get a foothold, we're now seeing as, as stable and have really have emerged. And then finally, of course, it's COVID. The pandemic has really caused a massive 
shift up in what we're doing, particularly with regard to technology. And if we think about artificial intelligence, my field, then we've seen a 20% increase in investment into AI from the previous quarter to this quarter. So 20% in one quarter is a massive, massive leap. And so what do we mean when we talk about digital transformation? Well, quite simply, it is the process of using digital technologies to create new or modify existing business processes, uh, teams, culture, uh, products, in order to meet changing or different business circumstances. And the core technologies that are uh, evident in digital transform transformation strategies are these. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, now the fastest growing tech sector in the world, currently $39 billion invested in it, looking to increase to $126 billion worth of investment into this sector by 2025. In that same five years, we will see virtual reality and augmented reality coming of age, and they will have uh, those technologies will be around uh, uh, twenty-one billion dollars worth of investment by by that stage, growing at seventy-eight percent uh, each year. Uh, Internet of Things is around uh, quite a mature technology now, eighty-two billion dollars worth of market value, growing ten percent per annum, and blockchain and cryptocurrency. That sector, uh, blockchain is worth about $3 billion currently in its market value. It will increase significantly to about $73 billion a year 2025. So you can see these technologies are, are no longer fledgling, are no longer just emerging, they're well emerged and they've been really ramped up based on the fact that we've had this pandemic. And so what might be some super cool things that have just popped up uh, in the last six months? because we can now have these factors at play that help us innovate and help us really transform digitally. Well, I've just chosen a couple that I thought were cool to share with you. So one is air taxis. So air taxis are you know, pretty heavy things to be flying. Um, so they've now developed power packs that are the size of notebooks that power these air taxis. Quite extraordinary. So air taxis, who knew, uh, are actually a thing now. Second is quantum computing. So quantum computing used to be in the labs with researchers, is now through organisations like Microsoft uh, Azure Quantum Cloud Computing available to businesses to use. Uh, even very cool things like connected elevators, digital, really digitally enhanced elevators. Kone uh, released in the last month their first, the world's first digitally connected uh, elevator. Uh, personal translators are one of my favourites. So uh, those of you who don't speak a lot of languages like myself, no need to worry about that now. This machine can translate up to 100 languages in one second. So uh, quite extraordinary. And then uh, autonomous farming. So again, as a farmer, it's very hands-on. Uh, we do a lot of physical work. The environment is obviously very involved in farming, but apparently no longer so. Environmental agricultural pods exist now where there's no human needing to be involved in these self-contained pods. Um, you know, quite, uh, quite wonderful inventions uh, all coming up in the last uh, six to 12 months. And then what should we see as a result of the, the world really taking on board digital transformation strategies? Well, here are a number of cool things that we should expect to see. So one is that we start talking about the internet of behaviors. So the internet of behaviors is taking physical data, digital data, putting it together and be able to accurately uh, predict how people are going to behave, to invent and produce new products, to transform businesses. The internet of behaviours will be um, beyond just the internet of things. Second core thing is the hyper automation, hyper automation or hyper personalization. Hyper automation is automating everything you possibly can. And hyper personalization is using machine learning to really understand your customers better than they understand themselves and be able to uh, get to them before they even know they have an intention to buy something. Total experience is a very exciting new field. Instead of just doing customer experience, we'll see customer experience plus digital experience plus employee experience being the core things that business focus on. Anywhere operations literally means that uh, COVID has meant we've had to go and set up businesses in uh, operations in our backyards, in our holiday houses, uh, in all, 
all sorts of places around the world and we now have operations anywhere and everywhere and then underpinning these operations must be cyber security so we call that the cyber security mesh which means that the mesh will reach out and not just be wrapped around an individual building in a traditional sense but actually now will will need to be providing security and privacy for individual workers wherever they're working and then finally a, a core thing we'll see with digital transformation is what we call transformable businesses so businesses that can pull themselves apart into modules and put themselves back together to meet the requirements of the new market. And again, very important if we're assuming that this is not the end of our time of uh, crises and change, that there will be other challenging times ahead. And so what do we need by way then of leader behaviour in order to lead us through these changing times. Well, I did a, a study on the concept of a crisis leader. What is a, a good leader at a time of crisis? And had this published in Yahoo Finance and I've put the, um, the link down below. So here's what I, I learned. The very good successful leaders are those who will be able to have a strong sense of signal detection. So that is they know something is going to happen before it happens. They can read the signs, they pick up evidence, and they're aware that whether it's months or years out, that something is going to happen that would greatly impact the business. Second thing is they will be data-driven critical thinkers. So not just relying on traditional uh, business modeling and, and thinking models, but really everything being data-driven. These leaders will be able to effectively manage political interests and other interest groups. So this may be shareholders, investors, uh, board members, uh, core executives or employees who have other interests or political agendas and the, the, the core new leader behaviours will be those people who can manage that effectively. The, the effective leader will be digital, digital transformation focus. We've talked a lot about that in the session today. They will also be able to have a what we call a multicultural lens in their communication so that understand different stakeholder groups and to be able to use the lens of that stakeholder group to effectively communicate with them in order to do what we call mobilizing collective action so to move disparate groups of people in your organization towards a shared vision and then finally and i think super importantly what we've learned through these times these difficult times is around how we as leaders need to be vulnerable transparent authentic and have deep empathy, whether that's for our staff, whether that's for our clients, whether that's for our even our competitors. And so uh, on that, what I, I hope is that you, you know, as uh, we Australian businesses, we're resilient, we're adaptable. And what I believe we need to look at is really focusing on how we digitally transform our business to make sure that we are able to uh, not only just uh, respond to the current uh, challenges that we have, but for us to build a strong export business going forward, no matter what crisis is upon us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Katrina. Look, business leaders need to continuously look to the future to understand what skills are needed. It was interesting to hear you speak of emerging technologies, as I'm sure many watching are curious which new technology they should embrace today. One Queensland business that adopted new technology is Icon Group. As one of Australia's largest providers of cancer care, it took what was normally done in a physical environment online using augmented reality headsets. Can you imagine? Icon Group's clinical experts in Australia were able to train, guide and assess clinicians in China in real time without being in the same room. Incredible stuff. It's not only important to look at what solutions provide value to your customers, but also looking at ways your customers get the most from your products and services. Like digital intelligence company Fivecast, it developed an online learning platform to support their customers to make sure they get the most out of Fivecast programs. Not only did this help them retain their overseas customers, they managed to increase the value of contracts with their largest customer, all in the middle of a global pandemic. You've heard just a handful of stories about the innovative ways in which your fellow exporters have used technology to protect their business, find new income streams and lay the foundation for growth. There are plenty more stories, 
So look out for them on the Australian Export and Investment Awards website, exportawards.gov.au. We've come to the end of what has been an enlightening and inspirational show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again to our guest speakers, Tim Beresford, James Pearson, Daleen Ray, Alan Oppenheim and Sarah Liu for their time, as well as our keynote speakers, Gus Balbonton and Dr Katrina Wallace for sharing their advice and insights. And our special guest, the Governor-General of Australia, David Hurley, as well as the Senator, the Honourable Simon Birmingham. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you for sharing your stories with us. Be proud of your achievements. Every single one of you demonstrated why Australian businesses are some of the most resilient, hardworking, creative and optimistic in the world. You've not only survived, a lot of you have thrived. And that is a massive accomplishment. What's clear from your stories is that companies are already preparing for a brighter future. As I mentioned earlier, we received over 360 stories from companies, large and small, right across Australia. And there is lots for us to share from your experience to inspire other businesses. We know that your stories of diversification and innovation will be of value as businesses look to rebuild. Your experience and advice may encourage another company to rethink the way they do business, explore new export strategies or expand into another market. And you might even find fresh ideas to improve your operations or take your business in a new direction. So from today and into 2021, the Australian Trade and Investment Commission and its partners will share your stories, anecdotes, quotes and advice. Please do head to the Export Awards website to discover more. We want the rest of Australia and the world to hear how strong, resourceful and innovative our exporters are. I'd like to finish on this quote from Aspen Medical. Australians truly believe that we are in this together. We knuckled down and did the hard yards. We adapted. We adapted quickly. We responded to the challenge. We're resilient. I think they have pretty much summed up the Australian exporting community. Thank you and I wish you continued success in your export journey. Stay safe and stay well.